morning. Good morning, everybody. And it's my real pleasure to start the day. I'm really, really delighted to start the day with the updated ESC Heart Failure Guidelines for the treatment of mitral regurgitation, mitral regurgitation. What you need to know. And in fact, this is extremely important because it's very new, it's very hot, it's extremely relevant what we are going to see in this satellite symposium sponsored by Edwards. Uh, we have uh, terrific spe speakers here, and we do have Marco Metra from Italy that will address what is really new and what is uh, exactly the, the top messages from treating mitral regurgitation in this setting. And in addition to that, we will have Bernard Pendergast from the UK, and he will address he will address the tricuspid regurgitation issue. But we want to be interactive. You are the most important. And in fact, we want to discuss with you these uh, topics. So please don't be shy, send us your questions, and we will be more than happy to answer. And uh, so Marco, uh, you need to start now with the assessing the new guidelines for mitral regurgitation, the update and clinical implication. Please advance the slide and give the floor to Marco Metra. Yes, thank you, Pepe. Thank you for Edwards for having organized this uh, symposium also because i am very proud and happy to be able to present the guidelines we have been working on for uh, two years uh, this is uh, the composition of the task force and uh, next slide and uh, next so uh, we have uh, uh, envisaged a treatment for primary organic mitral regurgitation nothing uh, new uh, surgery uh, and preferentially repair is recommended in patients with severe primary MR and NR failure symptoms. And if surgery is contraindicated or considered at high risk, then percutaneous repair may be considered. Uh, nothing new. Next. Uh, what it is new uh, is now, uh, uh, first of all, the overall approach to the patients with heart failure and the reduced ejection fraction. That's uh, an approach that I like to uh, um, present as a phenotypic, a phenotypic based approach. Uh, so we have four drugs for all the patients, but then uh, we have to look at the characteristic, uh, characteristics of the patients and if possible, have a personalized treatment. And among the characteristics of the patients, uh, we know that we have patients with uh, uh, moderate to severe mitral regurgitation in whom, as you can see, uh, uh, transcutaneous edge-to-edge uh, -edge mitral valve repair uh, should uh, or maybe con should, con should be considered uh, when some criteria are fulfilled. Next slide will show you uh, better how things are. Uh, next. And this is the algorithm that we uh, designed for the treatment of uh, uh, mitral uh, secondary mitral regurgitation in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. You, uh, first of all, you have uh, two categories above. Uh, one uh, is the patient who is to the uh, upper right is the patient who uh, is not receiving optimal medical treatment and is not receiving CRT if indicated. Uh, these uh, uh, two steps are mandatory in uh, uh, all our patients. Then to the upper left, you have the patient who has a need for coronary revascularization. Uh, this is a patient who has uh, a, a preferential indication to surgery, uh, cabbage, and uh, concomitant mitral valve surgery uh, to treat mitral regurgitation. This is a class 2A indication. Uh, but then also in this case, we may have patients who have high risk for surgery in whom percutaneous treatment may be indicated and then followed by a revaluation of mitral valve regurgitation. Uh, then, even when we are done uh, with uh, uh, these two uh, major aspects, we know 
that we are left with a large uh, proportion of patients who still have uh, secondary uh, mitral uh, valve regurgitation and heart failure. And in this case, next slide, we have the evaluation by the art team. And I think the first thing that uh, a clinician must do is to look whether the patient has COAPT-like criteria. Because COAPT was, a random, was the randomized clinical trial published in 2018 and showing a benefit of a percutaneous edge to edge treatment of mitral valve regurgitation uh, in patients with heart failure. Uh, however, these patients had to fulfill uh, criteria that uh, uh, may now be considered uh, uh, mandatory to have a class 2A indication. That is to say, a patient, and it is here, uh, should be. Uh, uh, should undergo percutaneous treatment when ejection fraction is about 20%, the ventricular and systolic diameter is below 70 millimeters, millimeters, systolic pulmonary artery pressure is below 70 millimeters of mercury. We do not have a severe right ventricular dysfunction or, and or severe tricuspid regurgitation. And we know that the right ventricular dysfunction, for example, was not considered in mitra FR and may have uh, led to uh, uh, the treatment of patients who did not benefit for outcome. And the patient must have hemodynamic stability. If this coapt like criteria are fulfilled, the patient should be considered for percutaneous treatment with a class 2A indication. Then we have the patient that the art team may consider as low risk for surgery, isolated mitral valve surgery, despite FRF, and this can be class 2B indication. And then we may have patients who do not fulfill the coap like criteria, but may be considered for uh, percutaneous treatment with the aim of improving symptoms and or as a bridge to transplantation or to LVAD with a class 2B indication. Next slide. And here we have these options again. Next slide. And this is my final slide. So uh, the recommendations that we had uh, we are having for the 2021 guidelines are two, two A recommendation, uh, percutaneous edge to edge mitral valve repair to be considered in, in carefully selected patients with secondary mitral regurgitation, not eligible for surgery and not needing coronary revascularization, who are symptomatic despite optimal medical treatment and who, who fulfill the uh, criteria of COEP. This is 2A with a level of indication, class of uh, level of indication B because we have the COAPT uh, trial. Then uh, we have mitral valve surgery in patients with mitral valve reg uh, regurgitation who need the revascularization, 2AC. And then we have 2BC again with percutaneous edge to edge mitral valve repair to improve symptoms and as a bridge to transplantation or LVAD. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Marco, for this uh, great, great overview and direct to the point. We have a couple of questions and I will involve both of you in discussing this issue. So, uh, Marco, here we have a question quite, quite challenging. So you have a patient uh, with moderate mitral regurgitation and heart failure and with optical, optimal medical treatment. But the, the severity is moderate from the MR. How often will you recommend to follow this patient and to perform new echoes? Because the MR is dynamic. <laughs> Great question. Uh, well, uh, it depends on what we consider for moderate. Uh, we now know, and you be know better than me, than uh, there are criteria like uh, the effective uh, the hero. Uh, that are uh, very important. And we, we, we know that, again, having the criteria used in COEPT may give a, a better results. And actually, I mean, uh, the uh, ERO may be also predictive of uh, the post-mitral -mit 
uh, or um, um, percutaneous treatment uh, results. Uh, another uh, method that I would uh, uh, consider is uh, um, uh, echocardiography during the exercise, because uh, if the patient has breathlessness during the exercise, uh, and uh, you, you may easily uh, detect uh, an increase in the severity of mitral regurgitation during exercise, and this gives you uh, more uh, data supporting uh, the percutaneous treatment. Yeah. Uh, Bernard, one question for you. So we do know that patients with severe with massive torrential uh, um, MR in the same way as TR, uh, they develop really, really bad. And maybe early intervention is, is uh, an option for there, mainly because we have the data of early intervention with surgery, but we don't have the data from early intervention. This is moderate to severe in uh, patients percutaneously treated. So do you think that early intervention here may help also? I assume you're referring to the scenario of the asymptomatic patient, perhaps, or the patient at the early stage of LV deterioration on echo. So I, I agree with you, Pepe, that surgery should be the first treatment modality in these situations, because that's, the, uh, that's what both our experience and that's what our evidence tells us is an effective intervention. We've known that for many years, if not decades. On the other hand, if the patient is, isn't suitable for surgery, and there are many patients with valve disease who fit that description, then it's a reasonable extrapolation to feel that reduction of mitral regurgitation using transcatheter techniques will be an equally beneficial intervention. But I think we need to proceed with caution, and the guidelines support that with their 2A recommendations, even within the conventional settings. So we need to be cautious in the asymptomatic early disease patient. Yeah, in, in that sense, Bernard, here is another question coming that uh, fits with you. Why don't we aggressively perform mitral valve repair instead of waiting for symptoms in patients with severe MR? Okay, well, I, that's a very important question and that reflects the very, very wide variation in practice uh, in all countries around the world. For many years, the guidelines have recommended earlier intervention if mitral valve repair is technically possible and if the operation is done in a heart valve center with expertise in assessment and in the surgical performance of mitral valve repair with a 95% probability of successful repair. So the important message I think is that you need to refer early to a specialist center. You need to be assessed by a uh, people who are experienced in the field and you need your operation done by a dedicated mitral valve repair surgeon. Marco, um, well, here is a difficult but uh, in daily practice question. In a patient whose coronary anatomy is not suitable for PCI and need for urgent cabbage, should we repair the mitral valve for secondary mitral severe mitral regurgitation? Yes, I think so, yeah. yeah. It's also in the algorithm. And, and what would you do I with... I think it's the opposite. Eh? Uh, um, also looking at the uh, guidelines for... Uh, the guidelines we gave for coronary artery disease, uh, actually in patients with FREF, uh, we have, although there are no randomized trials, but we have data in favor of cabbage. Uh, so if the patient has uh, uh, multivessel coronary artery disease, any indication for cabbage, uh, it should, and mitral valve, valve regurgitation, I think he should undergo uh, surgery for mitral valve regurgitation. Yeah. Um, Bernard, well, it's a, uh... In, in fact, I think it's a luxus that to be having you both here. But Bernard, can you tell me what is your impression about the guidelines? What is your, general, <laughs> your impression? <laughs> well, I know the impression of Marco. So, <laughs> and I'm sure many, many, many of the audience is really willing to uh, to know your your answer here. Well, the the guidelines are very, very welcome for, from the valve disease perspective because, firstly, they emphasise that valve disease may either be the cause or the consequence of heart failure. 
And that means that we bring together the worlds of valve disease and heart failure, perhaps for the first time in a meaningful way across Europe. Mm. Secondly, um, it's good to see that the messages of COAPT and Mitra France have been amalgamated and incorporated into robust recommendations at ESC guideline level. And thirdly, it emphasizes the importance of detailed echocardiographic assessments to weedle out the co-apt like patients who based upon the evidence will gain the most from transcatheter repair for secondary mitral regurgitation. That for me, those for me are the three essential messages. Yeah, and, and then a final question before we move to the tricuspid regurgitation and for both of you. So we have a patient with severe mitral regurgitation, asymptomatic with dilated left atrium, so severe MR. The ejection fraction is about 55%, normal LV, not dilated, no pulmonary hypertension, no tricuspid regurgitation. So how frequently do you follow in your clinic? How frequently do you follow this patient? So this is a not uncommon phenomenon, particularly in elderly patients with long-standing atrial fibrillation who develop uh, annular dilatation of the mitral valve with uh, so-called atrial mitral regurgitation or tertiary mitral regurgitation. These patients uh, do benefit from intervention, but they need to be carefully selected and they need to be followed very carefully uh, in my practice at least every six months to look out for signs of impending clinical and echocardiographic deterioration. What do you think, Marco? Yes, absolutely. I, I fully agree and uh, nothing to add. Yeah. And Marco, this is a final question for you coming from Dr. Pinilla from Malaga. Uh, congrats for the presentation, Dr. Metra. In case of a patient with a mild, moderate, secondary mitral regurgitation and uh, class Two, three, two, two, three. Should we consider exercise-based echo to assess the severity of the MR? Yes, again. Uh, well, there is this class two. I mean, if the patient is not, I mean, symptoms. Uh, I think symptoms are the main uh, uh, point in this case. So, if the patient is mild to moderate, so it's mild. Uh, mitral regurgitation, and if it's symptomatic, I think exercise, uh, uh, echocardiography would be important. And if the patient develops a more severe, a severe mitral regurgitation with pulmonary hypertension, uh, it may be considered, even if it's not in the guidelines, uh, but uh, uh, it may be considered uh, for percutaneous treatment or some other uh, procedure uh, percutaneously to uh, to to prevent ventricular dilatation and dysfunction. Okay, we need to move uh, to tricuspid regurgitation. That also is quite challenging. And then I will give the floor to Dr. Pendergast. So thank you, Pepe. If we could advance to the next slide, please. So it's worth reminding ourselves that uh, mitral valve regurgitation or transcatheter intervention for mitral regurgitation has been a relatively slow moving field. Transcatheter edge to edge repair has been with us for almost 20 years uh, before the guidelines that we've heard announced today. In contrast, tricuspid valve uh, transcatheter intervention is moving relatively qu quickly and has only been with us for three to four years, but is already a very active discussion. In other words, the tricuspid valve is no longer the forgotten valve. It is a valve that is very much in the center of our discussion and the, in the center of our current advances. Tricuspid regurgitation is a difficult entity to assess clinically and echocardiographically, and consistent with the mitral valve and heart failure guidelines, assessment and by a multidisciplinary heart team involving heart failure specialists, and in many instances, pulmonary hypertension specialists, is a very important consideration to reach the appropriate treatment option for each individual patient. There should be low thresholds to intervene on the tricuspid valve surgically, uh, 
in patients who are undergoing left-sided valve or other cardiac surgery. And transcatheter techniques are recently emerging as alternatives to surgery in these patients who are frequently elderly with multiple comorbidities in whom open cardiac surgery is not an attractive treatment option. We have experience from registries using the uh, transcatheter edge-to-edge uh, -edge technique and new uh, refined tools using adaptive technology to address transcatheter treatment of these patients. I think Bernard is a clear overview and also just showing what is coming that for sure will impact in our practice. And with this in mind, I have here a couple of questions that returns us to uh, the daily practice. Bernard, in a patient with heart failure, this patient has atrial fibrillation that we have not touched this, but is quite frequent and very common among our patients. Therefore, dilated both atrium and significant mitral regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation with moderately dilated left ventricle and good LV function, still symptomatic under optimal medical treatment. So what will you do here? Surgery, percutaneous treatment. So remember atrial fibrillation, optimal medical treatment, normal LV function, normal right ventricular function, still symptomatic. So first to say that this is a common scenario as these uh, transcatheter techniques become more widely available, um, we are seeing more and more of these patients being referred. Usually they are elderly and usually they have comorbidity and therefore surgery is generally not a very strong consideration, particularly when you can offer a relatively safe transcatheter treatment alternative. So the next question is where, if you undertake or offer a transcatheter intervention, whether you address the mitral valve in isolation or whether you address both valves at the same sitting. And that has many uh, contributors to the decision-making process, not least of which is financial, um, but it's a very reasonable approach to undertake the mitral valve as an isolated procedure to then assess the patient clinically at three to four, perhaps six months in terms of their symptomatic response to the reduction of mitral regurgitation, the opportunity to reassess the tricuspid valve in its severity, and then return to the catheter lab and undertake as a secondary intervention on the tricuspid valve as a stage procedure. Yeah, um, any comment here, Marco? It's fine. No, 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 I fully agree. Perfect. Uh, uh, left atrial ablation may also be considered for, uh, above all, if the patient has uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, uh, if rhythm control is possible, uh, we, we, <laughs> we have also to remember this. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marco. That's a very important point in terms of the management of the arrhythmia as well as the valve. Yeah, although, although if, a, if a patient with severely dilated atrium yes. and severe MR uh, will be difficult. But yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Bernard, something else? I, I just wanted to say that it's, it's not about necessarily uh, restoring sinus rhythm. It's about adequate control of the atrial fibrillation and the ventricular rate, which as we okay. all know, can also contribute to patient symptom status. Yeah, so we, uh, another question for you, Bernard. On top of carcinoid disease, which would be the most common cause of isolated primary TR without pulmonary uh, uh, pressure, elevated pressure, or left side disease that one should consider for tricuspid valve repair? Okay, so that's quite a tough question. So carcinoid disease itself is relatively rare, uh, but of course it is a cause of isolated tricuspid valve disease. Many of these patients actually have idiopathic tricuspid regurgitation. It, it can be uh, related to organic disease of the, of the valve leaflets, but very often we don't understand the underlying mechanism. I would also point out that the most common cause in my practice is tricuspid regurgitation related to leads in the right heart, pacemaker leads or defibrillator leads, uh, which can impact on the function of the tricuspid apparatus and cause significant tricuspid regurgitation. And this is another very challenging group of patients.
Well, we have a last question before moving to the conclusion. It was very, very helpful, all your answers. And again, here, a very hot, practical, and up-to-date question. 57-year-old male, cabbage, and severe MR under optimal medical treatment is asymptomatic, but after a COVID-19 infection, he'll be severely dilated without symptoms. Weight or urgent surgery? What do you think? Marco, that has to be for you. <laughs> That's difficult. Uh, well, I, I must say that in general, these questions are very uh, connected with clinical practice. Very good. Uh, well, what I'm doing uh, sometimes with because I'm seeing this patient, uh, we wait a couple of, of months because uh, uh, my experience and uh, data are coming out that uh, uh, sometimes this deterioration may be related uh, uh, to the recent COVID-19. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, you, you go ahead and uh, I would consider the workup for coronary artery disease mainly. And, 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 uh, and uh, if uh, the anatomy is suitable and the risk is uh, relatively low, you consider cabbage and mitral valve surgery. OK. OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marco. Thank you, Bernard. Indeed, it has been a great session. Thank you, Edwards, for the uh, satellite and the ESC for the platform and for the Congress. I think it has been a clear, uh, hot uh, line session. And the message is, hard team, never forget about that. Implement the guidelines. We have new hopes for uh, treating mitral regurgitation with a 2A indication, as Marco clearly showed has changed from the previous guidelines and tricuspid regurgitation for sure. Many things come in and we will need to wait for the next meeting. Thank you very much and continue enjoying the ESC Congress.